Louis Gav, thank you so much for joining me here at Risk Hedge. Thanks for having me. I wanted to talk to you about something that seems to be floating around out there right now. There's this idea that the United States and China are in the midst of making some sort of an agreement over North Korea that involves a lot more than just a geopolitical game in terms of what's happening in North Korea and maybe shutting down the nuclear program and who knows what else, but also what's happening in the South China Sea and also what's happening economically between the two countries vis-a-vis -vis trade uh, and some other issues around reserve currencies and these sorts of things. What do you think about that idea? What are you seeing? There? From your lips to God's ears, uh, <laughs> it, would be, uh, it, it would be obviously a very positive development uh, if that was the case. I would say that uh, if you look at the Korean stock market that continues to make new highs and the Korean won that's also been you know, decently strong, uh, they don't seem to be saying that we're on the verge of a war with North Korea. Uh, on the opposite, you could think that the fact that the stock market, Korean stock market keeps on making new highs would be indicating that, yes, uh, some kind of grand bargain uh, is going get, to get struck. Now, I've always felt that Donald Trump comes into the White House and he views himself as a deal maker. Uh, and uh, so if he sits down with the Chinese and say, look, I want to get a deal done, um, the Chinese tend to be fairly pragmatic. And they know they have their own interests, lines that can get crossed, for example, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the line that you know, Donald Trump, as soon as he got elected, crossed by taking the, the Taiwanese uh, president's call. Um, so I think they've established, like, these are the lines that we don't negotiate on. Uh, anything else, we can negotiate on. So for example, today, you know, the, Donald Trump, of course, gets beef, the US beef into China, which is the world's fastest growing market. Uh, he gets uh, a change of rules for the auto, uh, US automakers, because the only way you could be uh, uh, selling autos into China was uh, as part of a JV. Right. Now all of a sudden you can do it uh, outright. Um, so uh, the Chinese, there's a lot of things, I think, that they would be willing to, to compromise on. Uh, now, is giving up the North Korean ally one of those things that they'd be willing to, to compromise on? Um, if it was to get the South China Sea, I think absolutely. Hmm. Um, partly because, frankly, North Korea has become more of a pain in the neck for, for them than, than anything else. Um, and so, you know, could China be in the background starting to engineer a coup uh, against Kim, Kim Jong-un, you know, top him, top him off and put another general in place, um, that would be an extremely, I think that would be an extremely bullish development. So you're not discounting this theory that maybe this is what we're seeing right now? No, I think it's very possible mm -hmm. uh, in, in the background. Um, look, I think if you, to your point, if you listen to things on the campaign trail, you would have expected to have a lot more tensions between China and the U.S. today, a lot more tension. Um, the Xi Jinping-Trump meeting was amicable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, th there's been very little tension between the two. And it does seem, to your point, that the U.S. isn't trying to stoke the tensions, uh, you know, not sending ships in, uh, in the South China Sea. Does that mean that it's just a wait-and-see phase and b both guys are kind of looking at each other across the room and, and kind of feeling their way, perhaps? Or perhaps they are ne negotiating actively behind the scenes so that Donald Trump can turn around and say, hey, I've got a win on this, a win on that, and a win on that. Um, now, I think what Donald Trump, the wins he cares about are less the geopolitical wins than the domestic economic wins, uh, whether those be from uh, announcements of large investments into U.S. factories or trade wins for U.S. beef and U.S. autos. Um, so, yeah, you got to hope that this is where we're going. Interesting. Okay, so I, I think there's been a, a general fear in the United States if the U.S. dollar uh, somehow has to share reserve currency status globally with China. But I've heard other people say that actually that's a positive development. I've heard you say that you see China moving into that role here, especially over the next few years. Mm -hmm. How could this potentially factor into some sort of a deal between the U.S. and China? I, I think this is a, a linchpin of it, to be, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where potentially the Donald Trump administration is different from all the, uh, the administrations that preceded it, and that Donald Trump is fundamentally a, a very mercantilist president. Um, he wants uh, the U.S. to move back to a trade surplus. And um, you know, fundamentally, you cannot run 
structurally the world's reserve currency and run a trade surplus because the world needs your currency. You need to be, to be exporting uh, that currency. Donald Trump is the first U.S. president in my lifetime at least that hasn't paid lip service to the strong dollar is good for America right. uh, uh, motto. Um, in fact, the very first interview uh, he did after being elected with the Wall Street Journal, he came out and said the U.S. dollar is too high uh, and we need it to go down to move back to a trade surplus. Mm -hmm. Now this is not what you say when you want to be the world's reserve currency. Um, so I think in Donald Trump's worldview, the, the burden of carrying the reserve currency has meant a decimation of U.S. industry and U.S. manufacturing job, and that that's been too high a price to pay, mm -hmm. and one that the U.S. isn't willing to pay anymore. Um, and to a large extent, he was voted in by Michigan, by Pennsylvania, by Wisconsin, by states who agree with that view. Um, and so I don't think, so China has a completely different view today. They want, they want the renminbi to become Asia's reserve currency. Um, and I think in previous administrations, there was a big pushback against that. Mm -hmm. You know, the TPP was a blatant attempt to try to contain China right. and keep the US dollar as, as reserve currency for the whole of Asia. Say, okay, we're gonna have this trading zone and the US dollar currency will be the currency of this trans-Pacific partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing Donald Trump does is kill it. Oh, it's in the bin. Yeah. Um, and you guys wanna trade in renminbi? Sure, go ahead, not my problem. Um, so uh, I think that that can be part of very much of the grand bargain. Interesting. How does it factor in what we're seeing politically in China with Xi Jinping assuming almost a, a lifetime role running China? How does that factor in everything that we're seeing here? Obviously, he, he doesn't need a war because typically yeah. leaders, uh, if, if they lose, they're out. Yeah, I think the, uh, the way you have to look at Xi Jinping is he comes in and claims from day one, my mandate is to make China great again. Um, he wants to come in and return China by 2049 to being the world, uh, to being a, basically a world leader. You cannot be, of course, an empire. And frankly, you know, if you look at the history of empires, the history of empires fundamentally is a road building exercise. Right. You bid roads, railways, canals to bring commodities and cheaper to the heart of the empire and bring finished goods out to the outer realms of the empire. And what does Xi Jinping talk about all day? One Belt, One Road, mm -hmm. Silk Road Fund, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. You know, all these big projects are fundamentally imperial projects. And you cannot be an empire on somebody else's dime. You cannot be an empire, you cannot be a strong country without having a strong currency. You know, for Xi Jinping, the, you know, this goal of projecting China's power across its borders, which, and he's very unique in that respect. Every Chinese president of the modern era was inward looking. You know, it was, if you went to work in the diplomatic service, you were a nobody in China. Yeah. You know, you, none of us can name the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China for years. It was right. because China was always inward looking. They, they had enough problems at home to deal with mm -hmm. that you didn't need to be outward looking. Xi Jinping is a change. He's outward looking. He wants to build this empire. And so he, um, you could say, well, that's gonna lead to a clash with the existing empire. Um, except, of course, if the existing empire, i.e. the United States, is very much focused on retrenching domestically. And one could look at Trump of saying, well, Americans don't want to be an empire anymore. You know, the, the whole Trump program is we focus at home uh, and, you know, we, we don't want to be an empire anymore. Now, you, maybe, you know, you look at what he's saying in the Middle East right now, et cetera, maybe that's changing. Uh, but by and large, perhaps the two empires can cohabit peacefully. There's been a lot of pessimism about the future of U.S.-China relations. Yep. Are you a little more optimistic given what you're seeing? I am because I think the, the Chinese are fundamentally uh, ex extremely pragmatic. Um, and they don't go into the relationship with the U.S. Uh, in a conflictual relationship. If you look at Russia, uh, Russia always has a little bit that chip on its shoulder kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And there is that, and that paranoia about the U.S. and frankly a, a bit of a victim mentality as well, which uh, leads to uh, resentment and, and, and the clashes. China doesn't have that at all with the U.S. It also doesn't have at all a different worldview. You talk to most Chinese people, they have the same aspirations as American people. You know, they want, they want to have the house, the cars, 
the, and the Chinese government, by and large, wants to put in place infrastructure that allows them to deliver this to, to the to people. Uh, so it's, I think there's, there's enough uh, pragmatism in the Chinese leadership that they won't want to enter into uh, conflict with the U.S. One step further than that goes back to what you were just saying is, you know, the U.S. can enter many wars and lose and it doesn't matter, partly because the wars are always fought abroad. Uh, they never fought on your domestic soil. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I'm sorry, you're Canadian, you're not American. Uh, they never, they never <laughs> from an American point of view. <laughs> from an American point of view, they never fought on America's uh, domestic soil. So um, you can enter all these wars and lose them, and it, there's no massive political repercussions. Uh, but yes, China knows that it's one loss and you're out. Um, and so the, the it'll, I think it'll, the Chinese leadership will tend to be a lot less naturally belligerent than say the US, the US leadership has proven to be over the past 40, 50 years, hmm. well, fighting wars all over the world. Fascinating insights, Louis. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Become a Risk Hedge Insider for free by visiting riskhedge.com. Each week, you'll receive vital analysis on today's geopolitical, financial, and social risks. Just visit riskhedge.com today to become a Risk Hedge Insider.